Good afternoon and welcome to March's Lunch and Learn Lecture. Thank you so much for joining us for what promises to be a very interesting and dynamic presentation. We're gonna give everyone just a few more minutes to join our stream before we get things started. Thank you for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn. We're going to give our friends just a few more minutes to join the stream before we get things started.
Sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Madeline McCauley, and I work in the Programs and Outreach Department here at Enoch Pratt Free Library. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's Lunch and Learn program, which Pratt hosts in partnership with the Maryland State Archives and Maryland for Centuries Project. Before we get things started, I'd like to remind you that should you have any questions or comments for our presenters today, please enter them in the comments or chat box below the video, and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our partner at the Maryland State Archives. Take it away, Owen. Thank you, Maddie. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Owen Lurie. I am the Outreach Coordinator at the Maryland State Archives. Our presentation today comes from Bert Comoro and is entitled A Maryland Mosaic for the U.S. 250th Anniversary, Finding the Historical Pieces to Create a Dynamic Picture of Maryland. The Maryland State Archives holds records of permanent value of the state of Maryland and serves as the state's historical agency. These lectures are an opportunity to hear stories of Maryland's people and let us highlight the use of primary sources and the value of archives in uncovering shared heritage. If you are interested in exploring our records, I hope that you will come and check us out. You can contact us and schedule a research appointment on our website, msa.maryland.gov. I hope that you'll join us next month on April 11th when Drew Shuptiravis, a citizen and cultural ambassador of the Pocomoke Indian Nation, will give a presentation about his work recording the oral histories, lifeways, traditions, and regional memories of place with tribal communities on and around Maryland's Eastern Shore. You can find a full list of our programs, including videos of past lunch and learns on our website. And you can, of course, find many more programs from the Pratt Library at prattlibrary.org. As a quick logistics reminder, if you have any questions for today's speaker, please submit them in the chat uh, as we go along and we will take care of those at the end. If you are a frequent visit viewer of these lectures, or just someone who has been interested in Maryland history, today's speaker will be very familiar to you. Bert Cumro has been a part of the Maryland history world for many years, and today he will tell us about his latest endeavor, the Maryland Mosaic, an initiative of the Maryland Four Centuries Project, which has created a list of Maryland firsts, firsts in the state and first in the nation, to create a picture of Maryland's role in the American experiment. The Maryland Mosaic has collected more than 130 people, places, events, objects, documents, and structures from all 23 counties in Baltimore City and from each decade from 1776 to the present day. You may not be aware of it, but a lot of firsts in American history took place right here in Maryland. Bert Comoreau began his history career studying ancient Greece and Rome at the University of Maryland College Park but moved on to early America when he discovered it was a more fertile field. After his graduate work, he helped pioneer living history in the United States and was a writer and popular speaker, a public television producer with Maryland Public TV, and led three important Maryland museums, Historic St. Mary City, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, where he was the founding director, and the Maryland Historical Society, now the Maryland Center for History and Culture. As the president of History Works Inc., a Maryland-based historical consultancy, he was a multifaceted public historian with a wide range of skills and experience to bring history to the general public. He's the author and co-author of five books and many articles. In 2018, he became the founding director of the Maryland Four Centuries Project, laying the groundwork for a successful Maryland commemoration of the rapidly approaching 250th anniversary of the American Revolution, and looking forward to Baltimore's 300th anniversary in 2029, and even further ahead to Maryland's 400th anniversary in 2034. Now, the founding director of the Maryland Four Centuries Project, Bert Comero. Oh, thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Owen, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, spring is here, it's a great day, and a little early maybe perhaps, but it's here. And we hope you uh, Maryland history buffs will really enjoy today's presentation. It's well-deserved by the state of Maryland. I wanna start with a question. And the question is, if we can get our slides started here, what makes Maryland special among the 49 states? Is it our weird shape? 
were cut almost in half in two places. I don't have my slides going here yet. Do you, uh, can we get some help on that? Let's see here. There we go. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, so this is the question. <laughs> is this weird shaped state um, the reason it's so special among 49 states? We're cut almost in half in two places. It looks like we're, we could barely function as a whole. In fact, it's the water that's uh, done it all to us. We have, let's go to the next slide. Good. We have the Chesapeake Bay, one of the largest estuaries in the world. And it makes the first cut into Maryland. and gives us thousands of miles of shoreline. Our bay seafood, next. Our Bay Seafood has made Maryland very, very famous. Next. The Bay has become a local and international highway over many centuries to fertile markets around the world. Next. Now rivers make the second cut. They tumble down from the Appalachian Mountains, feeding the Chesapeake Bay and driving Maryland industry in the process. Next. The Potomac River, the nation's river, owned, by the way, entirely by Maryland, has given us a wiggly and erratic southern border. Next. But it's also provided a setting for some of America's most important history, especially associated with the national capital. Next. It was the real border between North and South during the Civil War. Here, in 1862, a drawing of Confederate troops in the middle of the night boarding the Potomac to invade Maryland for the first of three times. Our geography has been our destiny and quite literally has driven Maryland's rich and unique history. Next. Maryland's central location, a border between the northern and southern thir 13 original states, made it the logical compromise place for the national capital in the United States. And here we have the very first capital in the 1840s. Next. Annapolis was the US capital when the Revolutionary War ended in victory. It was more centrally located between North and South. It had a brand new state house and was largely free from the fighting that vexed much of the rest of the country during eight long years of war with the world's strongest military power. Next. Let's take a moment here to look at a familiar map. Every state here is located with a state flag. Can you find the Maryland state flag? <laughs> it's amazing to me. You have to squint and you have to search to find Maryland among the other states. And we happen to have the most popular flag in the whole United States. Uh, we are 42nd in size among 50. Only a handful or smaller. Next. Our near neighbors are both so much larger than we are. To the south is Virginia, which once claimed all the then largely unknown lands west of the Appalachians. It also, on occasion, regarded Maryland as an unnecessary nuisance, especially in the 17th century. And you can see Virginia before West Virginia became a separate state during the Civil War. Next, it took two royal sur uh, surveyors in Pennsylvania to stop a fight over our mutual border, which went on for generations and sometimes led to violence. And they created, next, the straight as narrow east to west Mason-Dixon line. Now, this geography lesson, the, the result of 17th century English royal politics, tells us that next, Tiny Maryland wedged its way into a fertile spot and important location among the 13 original English colonies that became states on the continent's east coast. I really like this map because it shows the, uh, the settlements hanging on on the east coast at the beginning of the revolution. And you can see the population is pretty sparse. The 40 plus population is there where Maryland is tucked into the middle of all the states 
and you can see it in green here on the map. Now that lesson also tells us you don't have to be big to be important. And this is our big motto. Maryland is a small state with a big history. As we approach the country's 250th anniversary, it is important, even essential, to take stock of the role and the influence of this oddly shaped state we live in. Now I enjoy anniversaries because they bring our ancestors into focus for a year or two each time. I've been involved in six anniversaries, and the tendency in all of them has been towards self-congratulation and next celebration with fireworks and gratuitous political speeches. Now this time, our time seems different with less to celebrate. We are lucky to be in a state that doesn't tell us how to put our history on the table. After 50, over 50 years in the Maryland public history business, I approached the 250th with new eyes. I've enlisted my wife, Mary Blair, with her own background in the humanities, and our partnership has hatched a new idea. First, we ask ourselves some more questions. How can we make tiny Maryland stand out in a national anniversary in 2026? How can we pay the proper respect to Maryland's role in the history-changing Revolutionary War, but also take a new look at the whole of the past 250 years? Most important of all, how can we get beyond the one-and-done celebrations and get the public to engage all of Maryland's history, the good as well as the challenging? How can we use history to create some serious soul-searching about who we are? How can we go beyond the big population centers and get the entire state to put its local history into the mix? Now, here's the answer in a single sentence. Maryland is a small state with a very big history. Next. Enter the Maryland Mosaic Project. This Maryland Mosaic connects many stories or pieces into a picture of our state's amazing history. Those who join in can connect these past events to our de democratic future. Our approach is to emphasize firsts in our history, not just in Maryland, but also in the leadership of the entire nation, dual firsts. But you might ask why in the world are firsts important? Well, think about your own firsts, a first bike, a first kiss, a first car, a first job, a first sense of satisfaction that you have done something well. Now, these are good memories, sometimes complex stories that reveal something important about you. We think that you will find first to be very helpful in this mosaic as well. This approach will not give a complete picture of our state, but it will offer some serious history to prove what is truly unique about us. Next. We are launching exhibit number one this week, a Maryland mosaic book, a book a booklet with 120 mosaic pieces. Now the pieces are arranged next chronologically, next, beginning with the Maryland signers of the Declaration of Independence in July of 1776, and particularly Charles Carroll, of Carrollton, who was the only Catholic who signed the Declaration, and next, ending with the first use of DNA genealogy at Catoctin Furnace in Frederick County in August of 2023. Now, each one of these pieces is focused on next, a person, a popular jazz singer, Billie Holiday here, with her loyal dog, Mr. Next, a place, the College Park Airport, the oldest in the nation. And here are workers putting the Wright brothers' plane back together after a crash. Next, an object, a portrait by Joshua Johnson, America's first black professional painter. Next, a document, Self-taught astronomer Benjamin Banneker's 1795 Almanac. Next. Or a structure, the Castleman River Bridge, 
America's largest stone arch bridge in the U.S. on the 1815 National Road. There are also events as well, including a famous one, Washington's resignation in 1783 in the Maryland State House. Now, these are all focused on their roles as first and a few, ca a few cases last in Maryland and in the nation. We are found first in all 23 Maryland counties and Baltimore City, making this a truly statewide project. Now let's look at some more important Maryland first and see how they relate the past to the present. Next. America, a small nation, had the Maryland line, here fighting in North Carolina in 1781. They were the first and the best troops in General Washington's small army, and they were fighting a great force, the mighty British, in our revolution. Like Ukraine, fighting a big, powerful nation today, the Americans had to look for help. Who did they find, and how did it change the odds for victory? It was the French, fighting a hundred-year war with the British, who sent military supplies, and then an army that kicked the scale to the American side. The Continental Army, marching through Maryland to victory at Yorktown, was equipped with imported French muskets and ammunition. And here are some more mosaic pieces next. A toll road between Baltimore and Cumberland led to the first federal project, the first interstate national road, which was the route that opened the West to settlers. And here we have Irish immigrants breaking stones so that they can create a surface that's unlike anything before. It's called Macadamized Road. This is a, a, a group, this is a little story about a group of, of the first immigrants from Asia. And those immigrants were brought by John O'Donnell and they were left here and abandoned. And uh, they eventually got the Continental Congress's attention, but we don't know what happened to them. They probably didn't get any money to get back. But this man, John O'Donnell, made a fortune on the cargo he brought with him. And uh, with that cargo, uh, he created an estate called Canton, which became the modern estate uh, and the modern neighborhood. Uh, his statue was torn down recently because he, was a, an, he owned slaves. Next. Now, Baltimore's Washington Monument predated the monument in the national capital by 33 years. We were the first. In 1815, it got started. Next. And here we have uh, someone who you may not know, but he was so important in the, in the beginning of the Civil War in 1861. His name is Governor Thomas Holliday Hicks. And I will talk about him a little more later. Next. This is our man. William Dorsey Swan, you may not have ever heard of him, but he was America's first drag queen, and he was born enslaved in Hancock, Maryland. Next. Here we have uh, a man who you may not have heard of. His name was Judy Johnson, and he particularly uh, started a three-generation control over third base in the in the uh, the, uh, the uh, Major League Baseball. He was with the Negro League in the Hillsdale uh, Daisies, and uh, he retired in 1937 to be followed by Brooks Robinson and then, uh, and then uh, uh, Scott, uh, Mr. Ripken, who uh, became a, a well-known star in the Baltimore Orioles. Next. Here we have the, <laughs> the longest existing censorship board. It was eventually uh, removed in 1981. It's a cost-saving me measure. But they managed to look at every film and censor it. They were started in the First World War, but they didn't end until 1981. We were the last state to have a censorship board. Next. And here we have our Lunch and Learn partner, the Enoch Pratt Free Library, and they have their own mosaic piece. 
1886, it was the first library in America to open its doors to all rich and poor without distinction of race or color, and African Americans were invited in. It became a model for the Carnegie and many other libraries. And next, it recently nurtured a leader in Carly Hayden, who became the first African American, the first woman, and the first real librarian to lead the National Library of Congress. So the Pratt has plenty to talk about in its own programming next uh, during the anniversary year. Next. So we have our own uh, helpful partner, the Maryland State Archives, which will play a major role in 2026 as well. And uh, our idea, the mosaic idea, is designed to demonstrate what we have discovered and what it tells about Maryland history. Most important, Maryland is the quintessential border state. It has been our defining feature in geography and temperament especially during the 19th century, half south and half north. The first steps to creating a new U.S. Constitution goes back to the 18th century in 1787, and it came out of Maryland. It started with the Mount Vernon Conference, deciding who owned the Potomac River, it was Maryland, by the way, and it was followed by the 1786 Annapolis Convention, called by Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison, and that led to the Philadelphia Convention in 1787. Here we have the first illustration of the State House with a few other buildings. Uh, the one on the right, obviously, the Treasury Building still survives, but the tiny one in the background is a public urinal, believe it or not, that no longer exists. Next. Here we have the Naval Academy, the famous Naval Academy, and uh, it started with a very interesting story in 1845. We will take a look here for a moment at a drawing next. If you look closely at the drawing, you can see some people hanging on the stern of the ship. Well, in 1845, the Secretary of War, John Spencer, had a no good son by the name of Philip. And he had been thrown out of school all over the place. He had all kinds of troubles. And uh, the Secretary of War decided he would send him to sea to become a midshipman. And that was the practice in those days. They sent uh, naval officers as midshipmen to learn the trade on the sea. He was on the USS Summers off the coast of Africa. And he loved pirates. And he decided that he would create a mutiny. And he was serious enough about it, and he caused enough trouble that the skipper of the vessel decided that he had to call a court-martial. Well, they did take it very, very seriously. And over at the end of this court-martial, they sent he and two of his compatriots to death, hanging from the yard arm. When they got back to the U.S., obviously, they had to explain what they'd done, executing the Secretary of War's son but they found out that they could get away with it because it was, um, it was decided that they, they had to do what they did. Well, they also decided that they had to start a school, the Naval Academy, and they decided to go to a place that was separate from the rest of the bad cities where you could learn a lot of bad things, and they ended up uh, picking Annapolis, a, a nice, tranquil, quiet place where the Naval Academy was born. So it was born after this incident in 1845. Next. And here we have Baltimore in 1850. It was unique among American cities, 169,000 strong and growing quickly. It had a strong new population of immigrants and it had a mix of 10 free for everyone enslaved, a 10 to one ratio, giving Baltimore a social climate of opportunity and tension. Next, speaking of tension, <laughs> 1850 Baltimore was called Mob Town, and it was one of the most dangerous cities in America. This is a cartoon of the gangs holding the streets and doing whatever they wanted to do, all the bad things they were doing. 
And uh, these gangs were called the blood tubs and the rough skins. And uh, they had to be cleaned up by vigilantes, private citizens before the Civil War. So this is another uh, important thing for Maryland, that Baltimore was a mob town. Now, events in Maryland also played a big role in the run-up to the Civil War. Next. One of the things that ran up to the Civil War was uh, the learning ground for a famous abolitionist by the name of William Lloyd Garrison. He came to Maryland to find out about a more southern state in 1829, and he immediately got into trouble. He uh, went after slave owners in Baltimore. He was taken to court. He was fined. He wouldn't pay the fine. He was thrown into jail. And some people had to pay the fine and get him out. So he returned to Boston to become the famous abolitionist that we know. Here he is sitting with Wendell Phillips and John Seymour, the two famous abolitionists of the time. Next. Here we have... One of the big run-ups to the Civil War, the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, which was tested in Baltimore County and Southern Pennsylvania. A slave owner named Edward Gorsuch had four slaves escape into Pennsylvania, and Gorsuch took a posse with a federal agent to get them back. Gorsuch got himself killed right here in this drawing and caused a national incident. The president had to call out the U.S. Marines and the four escapees, for Mr. Gorsuch fled to Canada with the help of Frederick Douglass. Next. Here is our Maryland born and raised second U.S. Court, uh, the Supreme Court Chief Justice Roger Brooke Taney. He manumitted his slaves, but believed that blacks and whites would never get along. So the result was the 1857 Dred Scott decision. The U.S. Supreme Court voted seven to two that blacks could never be U.S. citizens. It was a big step towards civil war. Next. Another major factor in the march to civil war was John Brown. He had a hideout at the Kennedy Farm in Washington County as he made his secret preparations for his raid on Harper's Ferry in 1859. Next. The Baltimore riots of 1861 caused the first civil war bloodshed and created a dilemma for the Lincoln administration as Maryland moved toward joining the rebellious Confederate states. Next. Here's the unlikely hero I mentioned earlier, the know-nothing slave-owning Governor Thomas Holliday Hicks from Dorchester County. But he believed in the U.S. Constitution. Hicks moved the General Assembly from secessionist in Annapolis uh, to Frederick where it voted to stay in the Union. This was a huge, almost existential gift to the Lincoln administration. Otherwise, they would have been surrounded by Confederate states. Today, Governor Hicks has a large, but hardly noticed portrait in the State House exhibit between the statues of Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. Next. Another politician who had a completely different political position was the St. Mary's County secessionist, Congressman Benjamin Gwynn Harris. Harris prayed, uh, prayed the day after Gettysburg on the floor of the House of Representatives for a Confederate victory and was censured by the House. Later, he was thrown in jail for harboring two fleeing rebels in his uh, South uh, Maryland home. Next. Did you know that Maryland adopted two quite different constitutions in three years? In 1864, Maryland adopted a new constitution, freeing the Maryland enslaved three months before the U.S. Congress passed the 13th Amendment. In 1867, former Confederates returned to power and passed another constitution with many amendments that is still with us 157 years later. Next. In spite of big celebrations in Baltimore in 1870 for the ratification of two of the Reconstruction Amendments, the 14th granting citizenship to all Americans and the 15th granting the right to vote to all males, Maryland uh, did not ratify the amendments until 1960s and the 1970s. 
Much of the emphasis on FIRST highlights issues related to African Americans seeking full citizenship. Next. Maryland's role in the Back to Africa movement, the American Colonization Society in the 1820s, was unique. Other states had settlements, as you can see on this map, but way to the south at the bottom, Maryland had an independent colony called Maryland in Africa that was supported by the General Assembly for 20 years. Next. Maryland is famous for its role in the Underground Railroad with Harriet Tubman and her remarkable courage. Next. But what about Patty Cannon and her evil and treacherous ways? Cannon and her gang in the reverse Underground Railroad kidnapped blacks and sold them back into slavery. She also murdered more than 20 people on the Maryland-Delaware border in a reign of terror with her gang and was reported to have thrown a black baby into a fire. We're very familiar with Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, and Thurgood Marshall, and to a lesser degree, Benjamin Banneker. Next. But have you heard of James W.C. Pennington, the escaped slave who became the first black student at Yale? Next. Henry Highland Garnett, the fiery abolitionist who preached open rebellion against slave owners. Next. Josiah Henson, escaping enslavement and becoming the model for Uncle Tom. Next. Frances Harper, the first published black female writer. And next. Lily Carroll Jackson, the mother of the modern civil rights movement in the 20th century, and her daughter Juanita. Now, you will find a large number of entries in our collection related to African Americans. Black history is intertwined, intertwined with white history. Each account is half of the story. There's no enslavement without enslavers. There's no Jim Crow oppressor without someone to oppress. Next. Maryland's 2019 Commission of Lynching Truth and Reconciliation, the first in the country, remembers Maryland's victims like Howard Cooper, just 15, pulled out of a jail in 1885 and lynched in Towson. Each side creates the other, and we continue the struggle to recognize and claim our shared past and our shared future. Next. In the last 250 years, Maryland has had firsts in many military situations, and the bravery and importance of Maryland troops has been a big factor. Maryland's Marylanders saved George, uh, George Washington's army at the 1776 Battle of Long Island, which Owen Lowry is a big expert on. And then the Maryland line featured Washington's best and most dependable troops, black and white volunteers serving side by side throughout the long war. Here are the Maryland troops at the Battle of Long Island. Next, August 24th, 1814, British veterans routed the 6,500 Green Maryland and other troops at Bladensburg. The infamous, quote unquote, Bladensburg races became the worst defeat on American soil. It opened the door to Washington and President Madison fled for his life. Just a few weeks later, Maryland militia killed the, uh, uh, the British general and saved Baltimore in the nation. Next. During the Civil War, Maryland sent troops to both sides and two First Maryland regiments, one U.S. and one C.S., clashed at the 1862 Battle of Front Royal. No other state did that, and Marylanders fought again at Gettysburg in 1863. Next, September 17, 1862, was one of the darkest days in the Civil War, and over 12 bloody hours at Sharpsburg, 23,000 men fell, one every two, two seconds. The Battle of Antietam, the war's bloodiest day, was a draw. And General, Wash uh, General Lee's army escaped to Virginia. President Lincoln was able to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, publicly changing the reason that the war was being fought. Next. In 1944, another generation of Marylanders joined Virginians in the 116th Regiment, 29th Division. They were the only National Guard troops in the first wave of the attack on Normandy on D-Day. Next. Maryland was a leader in the race to reach the heartland. And here again, we have the National Road, 
a decades-long national project, built a straight path for millions all the way to Missouri, and it began with a toll road from Baltimore to Cumberland. Next. The role of the Baltimore and Ohio uh, uh, Railroad, the first in the nation, is so well interpreted at our museum in Baltimore, cannot be emphasized enough. The Iron Horse replaced horsepower as the fastest transportation and opened the entire continent in only 50 years. This is one of my favorite photographs, and it recalls an excursion to Western Maryland by a group of artists in 1858. And Maryland's pace has not slowed in the 20th and 21st century. Next. Here we have, in the, excuse me, I, I got behind here. Now, this is about the mud machine, because there was a famous machine that was the first in the nation that cleared out the channels for the ships, and uh, they were extremely important. And it provided work for Irish immigrants at the lowest rung. Of, of the social ladder. Next. And we have the Liberty ships. We produce more Liberty ships than anybody else. And uh, one of these still survives in Baltimore uh, as uh, the, the John W. Brown. It's still an exhibit in, in uh, the Baltimore Harbor. Next. And here we have in the 20th century, the first bookmobile introduced in Washington County in 1905. It, and uh, we have already mentioned the oldest airport in, in, in uh, America with the Wright brothers in College Park in 1909. Also for generations, Baltimore was a hotbed of famous early jazz artists. Next, a group of nationally recognized women in politics and culture have made Maryland proud. Next. We also invented redlining in Maryland in 1910, which solidified segregated neighborhoods. And we had the first U.S. vice president to resign in disgrace in 1973. So today, I can only scratch the surface of our busy and often intense history. But I hope that you can see how useful these firsts are in providing a doorway for all of us to discover what our past tells us. And we found some limits created by our search for firsts. We have only one entry that marks a first for the first people. Next. They lived here for thousands of years before the Europeans showed up. These Native Americans are hardly mentioned after the settlers drove them out of the colony and into the swamps of Southern Maryland. They lost their lands and have been in diaspora ever since. Their sovereign nations continue to exist in spite of efforts to erase them from the record. And one Maryland pioneer of the modern Indian movement, Philip Proctor, who became Turkey Tayak, was buried on his native land, now a national park, by congressional action after a lifetime leading the Piscataway Conway tribe. Next. We also have given, we also haven't really given proper recognition to the importance of the role of immigrants. Here are some immigrants at Locust Point, Baltimore, in 1911. Baltimore had the third largest immigration center, welcomed many thousands of Irish, German, and Jewish immigrants. Today's immigrants from many other parts of the world share their culture and their first with newcomers throughout the country. Maryland has become one of the most diverse states in the nation, but it's difficult to find firsts among recent immigrant groups that are both in Maryland and in the nation. We hope the 250th Commission can find a way to give full credit to all the immigrants who have given us a rich and complex history. Next. We sincerely hope that the Maryland Mosaic will be carried a step further by the state's 250th Commission and be an important part of Maryland's contribution to the country's 250th birthday. As each mosaic piece is adopted by a museum, historical society, cultural institution, or local group around the state, they can use their first to develop their own local programming in 2026. A mosaic piece can link your institution to a statewide network of other firsts that can be the basis of public programs in 2026. The mosaic 
can be an umbrella that gives widespread publicity to local stories across the state, joining cultural and historical institutions in common cause. Our state 250th Commission can link all of them in a full state network with statewide events. And now that our booklet is launched, what's next? The 250th Commission is in the process of adopting our Maryland Mosaic and its implementation in 2026 is the important next step. We have found over 150 partners around the state who own one or more of these firsts. They can use them to feature their local history as a member of the state's 250th umbrella efforts to publicize and support all of their 2026 programs. The Maryland Office of Tourism and the Maryland Heritage Air Authority can create a heritage tourism trail. The Maryland Department of Education can use the mosaic to develop local history curricula in the context of 2026. Now we know that there are many firsts out there and let us know what you think and if you have a first, if you have that addition with two firsts, state and national, to add to the mosaic and send them on for our review. Next. You can reach us at mosaicinfo at maryland400.org. The full mosaic with many additions will appear on our website in April. That's www.marylandmosaic.org. Org. We understand that you may want to see our book. It's not a state history. We produced a limited number only to sell the idea of first, the Maryland Mosaic to the Maryland 250th Commission, the Maryland General Assembly, the 13 heritage areas, and other leaders who might be able to use the idea and the project. So it's, re it's not readily available. We'll be putting all of our 140 plus firsts we have discovered online on our Maryland Mosaic website in April. Again, if you give us a Maryland first that we have not discovered, we will be happy to include it. The Maryland Mosaic is a product of the Maryland Four Centuries Project. If the Mosaic succeeds, you may see Maryland 400 creeping into the discussion. We could build from 2026 to Maryland's 400 in 2034, and we'll have a chance without competition to tell our entire history. So thanks for listening. We look forward to involving the entire state in a serious discussion of 250 years of Maryland's important role in the development of the United States. And thanks to everyone who helped put, us this, put this Maryland mosaic together. With that, I will thank you again, and I will take any questions. Hey Bert, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for sharing just a taste of what you guys have put together for this booklet. Um, and I was going to ask where people can can get a copy of it, but you've already kind of touched on that. So I just wanted to clarify: um, every, people can see the entire mosaic on your website. Is that correct? Yes, it will be available uh, with all the additions uh, in uh, in the middle of April. We're, okay. we're putting those together right now. We actually have 120 in the booklet, and uh, we uh, we have oh about 25 more. And I'm sure there are many more out there. So I'm looking forward to people uh, providing some firsts. You know. We yeah, must... this sounds beautiful because yeah. it sounds like as people send recommendations to you, it's something that can grow and evolve. Uh, that's great. Yes, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, I, we also had a question about what is something that has surprised you the most in, in firsts that you've seen? I think, you know, I've, I've been telling the story of the Naval Academy because it's so fascinating. I mean, I can't even imagine the situation when the, poor, the Secretary of War, who has nine children, has a bad seed son. He's, he was really, evidently, really rotten. And here he ends up getting executed by a ship captain out at sea, trying to supposedly learning to be a midshipman. I mean, it's just amazing. And that led to the Naval Academy getting started. Yeah, so, that's pretty wild. I mean, that's just amazing to me. But, you know, there's just so many amazing uh, stories that revolve around, especially around escaped slaves, um, you know, the, the kind of things that were so dramatic. And, uh, and the attempts 
in Maryland, not only to help people to get away, but the ones who are grabbing them and bringing them back and selling them into slavery. And mm-hmm. you have a, a place like Georgetown, you know, which has really come to grips with, with the issue, but it sold, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of 272 uh, slaves that were enslaved individuals that were on the Jesuit plantations in Southern Maryland and it sold them to the South. I mean, it's just awful. <laughs> and uh, those are the kind of things that really, really moved me and moved my wife as well quite a bit. Yeah. Um, were there any firsts from outside the 1776 to present time that you wish you could have included that you just weren't able to? Well, I think we, uh, you know, we decided when we were doing the book that we just couldn't go crazy. So Mm -hmm. we ended up putting together uh, 120. And we were wondering at the beginning if we could find find 100. Uh, But there, you know, there's some modern ones that are uh, important to everybody today. I mean, we didn't include Michael Phelps, which I think is uh, Mm -hmm. is probably uh, he's very important for his role in the Olympics. And. Uh, some of the other things that have happened recently in Maryland history. And uh, so, you know, these things are going to show up and we will we'll be able to include them in our website as they are, as they are brought to us. Yeah. Well, thank you so much again, Bert, for such an informative and engaging presentation. Um, I'd also like to thank our partners at the Maryland State Archives and obviously the Maryland for Centuries project. Thank you also to our partners at the Hearing and Speech Agency for providing accessibility for today's program. And thank you to our audience um, for joining us today. Everyone stay safe, take care, and have a good rest of your day.